So as Joe just said, I'll be talking to you about how we judge other people through the use of everyday attributions, and my name's Robert. So I'm sure a lot of people here have been to some sort of sporting event before. And personally, whenever I go to a sporting event, I always seem to run into this guy. He <laughs> seems to be a bit more excited than everybody else. He's a bit more into the game. And most of all, he just seems to stand out from the crowd. And when we first see this individual, we're likely to make some sort of instinctual judgment about his personality. We might think he's a very loud individual, we might think he's obnoxious, and we might even go as far to say we think he's an idiot. But no matter what kind of judgment we seem to be making, we're most likely making a dispositional attribution. We are taking his behavior in this one situation and using it to generalize to his entire personality. Now this is the key idea behind the fundamental attribution error. The FAE is an overestimation of disposition while ignoring situational factors. It's quite possible that this man only acts his way around a certain group of friends or at certain sporting events. He might even be under the influence of drugs and alcohol. But we choose to not explain it with a situation in favor of a dispositional explanation. Now, another person I might meet at the game is a father who's had to take his daughter along to the game. And while at the game, let's suppose the daughter spills her drink all over the father's pant leg. And quite notably, the father reacts in a, in a fit of anger and raises his voice at his daughter. Now again, you're going to have some sort of instinctual reaction, and you might think, wow, what a bad father, and here you'd be making a dispositional attribution. Now what we need to do here is we need to take a step back and think, hey, what if it was me in this situation? <laughs> so you, when it's actually you in the situation, you're a lot more aware of the situational factors that might be involved in determining your behavior. So you could have bought a new $100 pair of pants, you could have been pretty frustrated that you've had to take your daughter or your sister out for the entire day. So when it comes to explaining your behavior, you're going to make a situational attribution. You don't normally act like this, it was merely the situation that explained your behavior. So the difference between these two scenarios, although they may seem identical, can be explained through the actor-observer bias. We have a tendency to explain others' behaviors due to their disposition while explaining our own due to the situation. This is because in the first scenario here, we can consider ourselves the observer. We are on the outside looking in, and we don't really understand the actor's intentions or previous experience. But in the second situation, as the actor, you know exactly what kind of situational factors have been leading up to that moment, and you're better able to make a situational attribution. Now finally, one of the, last pe uh, one of the people we're obviously going to meet at the game is, of course, the player. So let's suppose Ronaldo, the star player of the team, has been scoring a lot of goals and has been doing very, very well. How is he going to explain the success? Well, according to the self-serving bias, we have a tendency to explain our successes to our disposition uh, in order to enhance our self-esteem. And, uh, and conversely, uh, when we do badly, we're going to explain our way, our failures to the situation, and this is in order to preserve our self-esteem. So the self-serving bias is all about keeping our ego intact. And we don't just use a self-serving bias for ourselves, we use it for the people around us as well. This is because we have a tendency to link our self-esteem to other people. So if a soccer coach, his player is doing very well, he's likely to attribute this to the fact that he's a good coach, which is a dispositional attribution. And conversely, if his player is doing very poorly, he's likely to explain it away from himself and say, my player is doing poorly just because he's having a bad day. It's not my fault as a coach. And unfortunately, whether we like it or not, we tend to do this ourselves as teachers. If one of our students is doing very well, we're likely to attribute this, this to the fact that we're very good teachers. If one of our students is doing very poorly, we want to explain this away and say our students are doing very poorly because maybe they haven't studied enough, maybe they've been a bit lazy. And this is when we link our self-esteem to other people, we do this, uh, the same reason as the self-serving bias. We want to keep our ego intact. We want to keep our self-esteem up. Now, to cap off, I've talked about three big kinds of biases. Now, I may have made it seem as though these are very innate or very instinctual biases, but in fact, simply being aware of bias can help you avoid it. So the next time you're in a disagreement or in a situation where you need to assess somebody's behavior, I want you to keep these three in mind. Keep in mind the fundamental attribution error. We have a tendency to overrate disposition while ignoring the situation. Keep in mind the actor-observer bias and that there's a Oh, sorry, and then there's a difference between the uh, actor and observer roles in a situation. So the best way to avoid this is to take yourself out of the observer role, put yourself in the actor's shoes, and you might be able to understand what kind of situational factors may have elicited his behavior. And finally, when you're working with other people, remember the self-serving bias. Successes are not necessarily a solo effort, and whether we like it or not, mistakes actually can be our fault. I hope you've enjoyed listening to my presentation and you learned a bit more attrib about attributional errors. Thank you.